And I invite you now to rise in body or spirit as we deepen into worship with our opening words. Come all who are weary with grief, heavy with loss, or exhausted by the strains of life. Come all who are hungry for an end to violence and injustice. Come all who are searching for belonging or purpose. Whatever we bring, wherever we come from, whatever we hope for, this sacred space can hold it all. Come. Let us worship. I invite you to be seated as we listen to our choir sing our opening hymn, Sing Praise to God. I invite you to join with me in the spirit of prayer and meditation. Let us pray. Great Spirit, gracious God, we give thanks for the be beauty of this day and for the joy we have to see and to be with one another again. We bring glad hearts today. We bring everything that is in our hearts and we lay them down here. People that we love, people that we're concerned about, people that are either here or in some other place. God, as we gather for worship today, our hearts are also all, with all who suffer in body, mind, or spirit, and all who hunger and thirst for justice. May our life together as a spiritual community help us to become more able to transform the world in which we live. We ask this in thy holy name. 
Amen. Please join me in the saying of our covenant. In the love of truth and in the spirit of Jesus, we unite for the worship of God and the service of all. Good morning. This morning in the time for all ages, uh, Margaret is away and it's my privilege and pleasure uh, in representing the racial justice journey steering committee to welcome again this week our uh, distinguished friend and first parish member, Ray Shepherd who is going to share something very special with us, definitely something for all ages. Uh, Ray says on his web page that he was very bored with history in middle school and high school when he was studying it, but that he found the stories told to him by his mother, true stories passed down from her mother and father. Uh, absolutely spellbinding and worth uh, telling to his own children. So now Ray has, after a career as a history teacher and a book editor, Ray has now turned to writing spellbinding stories of his own uh, about people, true stories about extraordinary people who found the courage to face dangers, and just the grinding hardships of every day in their quest for justice and freedom. He's going to share one of those stories with us, and he hopes, and I hope, that you will be telling this story to your family members, to your children and grandchildren. This is the book that he's going to share with us, and it's available in the Stearns Room after the service. Thank, thank you, Mary, and thank you, everyone, for being here. Let me, a true confession, um, I write for young readers, age three to 103. Um, in 1773, 1774, farmers in, in Lincoln, Concord, Lexington, felt that they had a natural, God-given right to liberty and to freedom. 
on that same in that same year, either in 1773 or 1774, Ona Judge was born enslaved on George Washington and Martha Washington's Mount Vernon plantation. It took her 23 years to find a way for, to gain that natural right of being free. So imagine you're a hardworking slave in a field or in the laundry room, and you hear that the woman who had the best job a slave could ever have, the personal maid of Martha Washington, has escaped. And as you lean on your hole, you say to yourself, or you say out loud, own a judge, own a judge. Why you run away, own a judge? You had fine dresses. Fancy bonnets for your bushy black hair. Soft shoes for your tender brown feet. Why'd you run, own a judge? You rode in a first class carriage with the lady who called you her own. On Cherry Street, she took you to the best houses when she visited other important ladies. Why'd you run, own a judge? You were the lady's favorite. She carried you from Mount Vernon when you were 16. Didn't ask if you wanted to go. Didn't ask if you would miss your mama. She hauled you to New York to brush her hair. She took you to Philadelphia to sew her elegant gowns. Why'd you run, Ona Judge? You ate the food Hercules cooked for the lady's husband, George Washington. You had your own room in the president's house with a fireplace and servants to bring you wood. Why'd you run, Ona Judge? You were the color of salt water caramel with freckles of cinnamon flakes. Your hair was a scent of dogwood. Your eyes shone like British coal. On Chestnut Street, men tipped their hats to you and Eliza, the president's granddaughter. They thought you were her friend. Why'd you run, Ona Judge? You saw history in the dining room table when you peeked through the kitchen door. Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, warriors and diplomats who made America free. Did you think they meant you? You didn't work in the buckwheat field. Your hands stayed soft, your clothes kept clean. Why'd you run on a judge? The lady read you stories from the Bible, told you her problems, didn't teach you to read, didn't show you how to write, wanted you the way you were, her pet, her darling slave. Why'd you run on a judge? Didn't you know you belonged to the lady like her favorite chair or a pair of silk stockings? She was getting old, wanted to keep you in the family, gave you to her granddaughter, Eliza. Eliza? The girl you played with when you were 10 and she was seven? Now a mean and sassy woman would keep you in fine dresses, fancy bonnets and soft shoes and let you rock her baby to sleep. Why'd you run, on a judge? But you walked out the door, ran into the Philadelphia night, left the lady and the president at the dining table. Didn't you know the lady would cry? Didn't you know the president would think you're ungrateful? You were walking out the door. Why did you, why you run, on a judge? Didn't you know being a slave in the president's house was grand? Didn't you know you broke the law? Didn't you know George Washington would send men after you? But you knew you were more than a $10 pet that the lady wanted back. In an attic, basement, or room no one could see, you waited for the boat to carry you on the underground sea. 
where your future would not be enslaved for the rest of your days. You were called a runaway, a fugitive, but liberty rang for you. You dreamed a dream you would make true to read and write, to do what you would to do what you want, to go where you liked, to make sure your children were not enslaved like you, like your mother, your grandmother, her mother too. Is that why you ran? Well then run on a judge. Run. Thank you, Ray. And we are now at the time in our service where some of us, the children and families, can go up the hill for RE. We do have the Stearns Room TV up for any families with unvaccinated children that would like to stay together and worship in the Stearns Room. And the rest of us, adults, vaccinated adults, will go into the sanctuary to continue worship. And when we do, we do ask that you please stay masked throughout the indoor portion of our service with your mask covering both your nose and your mouth and fitted closely to your face. Thank you. And we're going to do this like we did it last week. This is reverse wedding order. So we're going to start with the back row. And when they're gone, then the next row forward and that. So please maintain your distance, wear your masks. We'll see you inside. Thank you. I invite you to join me in our responsive reading, saying the italicized portion. People say, what is the sense of our small effort? A pebble cast into a pond causes ripples that spread in all directions. Each one of our thoughts, words, and deeds is like that. There is too much work to do. We welcome now to the time of the service that we set aside for silent and spoken prayer. In preparation, we will hear the prayer hymn with the soloist and organ. Following the hymn, we will have two minutes of silence, followed by a reading of the prayers that have come in through the chapel. <laughs>
So the ministers will pass amongst you now, and if you have a prayer, we would invite you to share it at this time. And then Doug is going to read the prayers from the chat. I'd like to say a prayer for our friend Wayne Dupre and his family as he is struggling to figure out quite what is causing his epileptic seizures. I invite you to send loving thoughts and healing to our wonderful octogenarian sheep herder, Ellen Raja. Ellen fell about a month ago and broke seven ribs. She's been in the rehab at the Commons, but she's coming home to her home tomorrow. So anyone who knows her, I'm sure you'll find a way to reach out to Ellen. A prayer of thanks for being in this sacred place with you today. And two prayers from chat. The first, prayers of strength and comfort from my friend Janice, as they mourn the loss of Janice's father at 98 years and 11 months, a life so well lived and therefore missed so very much. Second prayer from chat, for all those who are spending every waking hour trying to preserve democracy. We have one more prayer from the chat for my colleague Soha, who has lived with long COVID for more than a year. Let, <clears throat> let me take a moment to reread that last prayer because I know the microphone didn't work. Um, from Ben, from my colleague Soha, who has lived with long COVID for more than a year. We hold all these prayers, those spoken aloud today and those held in silence of our hearts. Amen. We'll start with our pastoral prayer. Holy God, we come before you in prayer, lifting to you the joys and concerns, the hopes and dreams of our lives. May we also be open to your voice in our lives, that we may see with new eyes and hear with new ears the direction you will have us go. Bless, we pray, this gathering of your people, that we may grow and flourish in your love and grace for the purpose to which you have called us. Hear are our prayers for those whose lives have touched us, those who are in pain, those who are ill, those who grieve. May we touch their lives not only through prayers, but through our lives and actions as well. 
guide us, bless us, uplift us, hold us. For we are your children called to our purpose in your world. Hear our prayers, those spoken and those hidden in our hearts. We pray in the name of Christ our Lord. Amen. And we'll follow that as the unison's prayer will be the Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Our kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs>
So our reading this morning, we have two very short ones. One is from Seamus Haney. I took the title of my sermon from him. This is an excerpt from his poem, The Cure of Troy. History says, don't hope on this side of the grave. But then once in a lifetime, the longed for tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. And from Amos chapter five, verse 20. God said, I hate, I despise your festivals and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings, I will not accept them. I will not look upon them. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. A lot of things up here on the pulpit this morning. <laughs> Can hope and history rhyme? This is a sermon on the connections between First Parish and Lincoln and slavery and the slave trade. And it's just a, just a beginning, just the very beginning of a journey. But I was thinking as I was working on this in the archives at the library this, this week, I was reflecting back on the first time I sat with some of you for my interview for this job as interim minister uh, three and a half years ago. We sat in Barbara Sampson's living room and we talked and you told me what had gone on the last few weeks. It was just a couple of weeks after Manish had submitted his resignation letter. And there were lots of thoughts and feelings in that room. And I heard about your desire to work on issues of uh, anti-racism and learning and growing in the area of exploring race and racism. And I was honest that that wasn't one of my core competencies, but that I would, um, would be a partner with you in it. And so since I've come, I've been so grateful to the leaders in this congregation who formed the Racial Justice uh, Advocacy Task Force and now are leading the racial justice journey. I've, I'm still a beginner, I feel, compared to many of you, but I've learned so much. Um, last, last June at the annual meeting, this congregation voted to embark on what it's calling a racial justice journey for the year with the goal of moving this community closer to becoming an anti-racist congregation. What would that mean? What would that look like? What would that entail? And so we've got a wonderfully curated um, series of, of lectures and actions and events all through the year, many of them on Thursday night. So this fall, I'm thinking of a uh, sunny, warm afternoon when I was in Bristol, Rhode Island with some of you at the home of the DeWolf family. The DeWolfs, it turns out, are one of the largest, if not the largest, slave trading family in New England. I've gone to Rhode Island in the summer for many years um, to the ocean with my family. And I'll be honest, I did not know that Newport and Bristol were the largest slave trading centers of New England. I think of the, uh, the uh, discussion last Thursday with Ray Shepard on critical race theory, learning that a private school in my town of Concord uh, withdrew an invitation to the founder of the 1619 Project. I think of many different, um, different moments in this journey, of, of my journey with you. Uh, Eddie Glaude's book that Ray recommended to me uh, a year and a half ago, and my learning a little bit about James Baldwin, and how he had to leave America for a lot of his life, to live in Paris and other places, in order to escape the toxicity of what he'd grown up with, the racism, and be able to write and develop into the writer that he became. And also how he was somehow able, even through his own depression, struggles with alcohol and suicide, he was still able to stand in what he called the ruins and name the truth about what he thought and what he believed was the big lie of uh, white people being superior to black people in America. So there have been many moments that stand out for me this week as I delved into this, um, this, uh, art, this research. 
So I took another step. I went into the archives. There are so many good books, I really didn't need to go to the archives. There's Elise Lemire's book, Black Walden, which is about slavery and Concord, but of course Lincoln was once, this land was part of Concord. There's Jack McLean's book on Lincoln. There's Charlie Styron's book on the origins of this church. There's that wonderful lecture Elise Lemire gave um, for the Bemis, the Bemis lecture, I, I think about a year and a half ago, about slavery in Lincoln. But I always have to see for myself. I don't know why, but you know, the book says there were these baptisms. I have to go back and look at the actual record book in the library. And as a minister, I've kept these records over the years. Ministers keep records of baptisms and marriages and funerals. And so I went back and I looked at some of the original records of the church. Um, so there's really three sort of um, three parts that I'm thinking about this morning. There are those records from the 18th century when the church was founded and the connection with slavery. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk about today. And then the next two parts, which I hope I'll get to later on in the year. In the 19th century, what was the preaching like in this pulpit, not in this church, on slavery? And then finally, the issue of finance. How much of the money that was donated to First Parish in Lincoln over the years, beginning in the 18th century, but continuing on up, how much of that had connections to the slave trade? So I have preached a lot of sermons in my ministry about the heroes and the heroines, the abolitionists, people like Theodore Parker. I've never preached a sermon on the connection of a church with slavery. But as you probably know, it's something a lot of churches in New England and around the country are they're looking into now. And so this is an unusual, what we're doing here. We're part of a much bigger, bigger movement. It is an easy history. It's easier to preach a sermon about um, someone that you can talk about their courage and their truth telling. It's tender, it can be difficult. It's not meant to inspire guilt or shame or anything. It's just simply, I think it's important that we know who we are and where we come from. I think that in my own personal life and I think it in communities as well. So what did I discover? Uh, I discovered, first of all, that slavery in Massachusetts in the 1700s that 21 out of every 1,000 Massachusetts residents was a black person, and that generally communities on the coast had a higher percentage of blacks than communities inland, like this one. So 5.2% in Boston, 5.9% in Cambridge, and then in the inland communities, it'd be much lower. So Concord would be 1.7, Sudbury 1.5, but Lincoln, Interestingly enough, it was a higher percentage. It was 4.3%, and that was because of Chamber Russell's having a great, a very large estate, about 275 acres. Uh, as I'll say in a minute, he was one of the founders of this church. And he had uh, a number of slaves, about five, I believe. And then Lincoln, in addition, had a number of larger than average farmsteads that needed slaves. So in the 1764 census, there were 649 people in Lincoln, and 28 of them were slaves. And if you consider back then that the town and the church were really one and the same thing, you can um, imagine that, I can't say for sure, but I would say that most of those people that owned the enslaved people were part of this congregation. So as I said, I went back to the archives, to those creamy tan pages of those old ledgers with the dark brown ink cursive handwriting. It's often very hard to read, and so I'm grateful to Charlie Styron. You can read his typed notes for his book, and Margaret Flint made a typed transcription as well. And I made lists, and I looked and poured over them. Um, when you think back to how this church was founded, you'll remember that in the 1740s in New England, a lot of the communities in this area were splitting off from one another. And Concord was a great, large, massive land, really. And the people in this part of Concord, the part that's now Lincoln, they didn't want to travel across the muddy, snowy roads in the winter 
to go to church in Concord. They didn't want to pay the taxes to support the minister if they weren't actually going to church in Concord. And they started to gather in Edward Flint's home and other homes and worship there. And the other thing that was going on was they didn't like the minister in Concord. He was a man named Daniel Bliss. He was a new light preacher in the Great Awakening. There were new lights, emotional, pietistic, revivalist kind of preachers, and there were the old lights, more conservative, more settled. A lot of the people here in Lincoln did not like Daniel Bliss and the new light strand of theology. And so they kept trying in the 1740s again and again to petition the General Court of Massachusetts to split off. They tried three, four, five times. And finally in 1746, after 10 years of trying, they were successful. And they were given permission to break off and become what was called a second precinct of Concord, Weston, and Lexington. And that was the original beginning of Lincoln. And they met for the first time in Edward Flint's home in 1746. And there are really three meetings that I looked at that were important. Because what I did is I looked at who went to the meetings and who among those people owned slaves. So there was that original meeting of the second precinct in 1746. There was a second meeting. Um, about a year later in 1747, when the builders of the, the church had been built, Edward Flint gave the land. They gave the building officially to the second precinct. I looked at the people that were at that meeting. And then finally in 1848, 25 men got together and constituted themselves a church and said they wanted to uh, find an orthodox gospel minister and demean ourselves both towards God and man as becomes a faithful church of Christ. That, I'm sorry, that was 1747. So I looked at these lists of people. So these are all the town founders. They're the deacons. They're the people that are going to make this new town and this church possible. And um, of course, in those lists of names, Brown, Brooks, Wesson, Garfield, Pierce, Flint, Parks, Wheeler, etc., many of them owned slaves. So just to, um, so Joshua Brooks and Nathan Brown, for example, they were some of the town founders and deacons. Jonathan Gove and his son John Gove. All these people had slaves and the one way we know that is they brought their slaves here to the congregation to be baptized. So there were 13 baptisms done at First Parish in Lincoln of, of members, deacons, bringing their slaves, usually children, to be baptized. And we have a list of those names and those dates. And um, then there was a man named John Headley. Back then, you got, if you were the richest person in town, you got to pick your pew. That, you, that, you got to be the first person to pick your pew. So John Headley was apparently the richest person in town in 1748 or 49, and he got to pick his pew, and he also owned uh, enslaved persons. Chambers Russell is a name many of you know, the Chambers Russell Codman Estate over on Codman Road. Um, his family had made its money in slave trade. They had plantations in Barbados and Antigua. And um, he was part of those early meetings to found the church. And uh, in 1754, when Lincoln was incorporated as a town, they elected Chambers Russell as the moderator, the first moderator of the town of Lincoln. And he also had a, a, a role in naming the town. He named it Lincoln because his grandfather had come from Lincoln, England. And interestingly enough, one of his grandfather's slaves was also named Lincoln. There was Timothy Wesson, one of your early uh, deacons. He was a house right and lived right next to the meeting house, which was located at the top of the hill where the stone church is now. And um, he was given a slave by Chambers Russell. And in turn, when his daughter Abigail married John Cumming from Concord, an up and coming young man, Timothy Wesson gave his slave, whose name was Brister, to Abigail and John as a wedding present. And Elise Lemire has written extensively about the Cumming family and about how John Cumming was able to become the gentleman, the Harvard donor, the uh, leader that he was in part because uh, of the slave at home doing the work to allow his family to become what it became. And she's a wonderful work on John Cumming. 
Finally, Edward and Ephraim Flint. Edward Flint gave the one acre of land that um, made the meeting house possible. He and his wife, Love Minot Adams Flint, owned slaves. Ephraim Flint, his nephew, who gave the land that allowed the burying place to be, to be um, for the first burying ground for the church. Ephraim Flint also owned slaves. And finally, the first minister, Reverend William Lawrence and his wife, Love Adams Flint, the stepdaughter of Edward Flint, they owned slaves as well. And so when William Lawrence came here in 1848, when the church was first gathered, he uh, would stay for 31 years. He had a great farm at the top of the hill. He was a farmer as well as a minister. And he was the one who performed these, wrote in the record book, performed these 13 baptisms of enslaved people, as I said, mostly children, in the church between 1752 and 1770. There were two marriages and also several instances written down when a slave would own the covenant, which was a particular thing back there in New England. So my discovery this week took me, as I said, mainly into the 18th century. The records toward the end of the 1700s start to sort of, there's not, no more records of baptisms or anything like that. And I'm really looking forward to Don Hafner's lecture, which will be next Thursday evening at 7 on Zoom, because he is a historian, I am not, and he is um, going to be also looking at the 18th century of blacks living in Lincoln. Um, so slavery was abolished in, Ma in Massachusetts in 1781, and so some of the questions that still are on my mind that I want to explore, what happened to the enslaved persons living in Lincoln after 1781? We know that several were given their freedom by members of this congregation. They would do that in their will, but what about, what about the others? As the 1800s got started and the decades rolled by and abolition started to build in New England, what was the, this church's stance on abolition? What kind of preaching was done, if any, about that? We know that William Lloyd Garrison founded the weekly newspaper, The Liberator, in 1831. It would run until 1865 as a powerful force for abolition. We know that Mer uh, the Concord Anti-Slavery Society was uh, formed in 1837 in the parishioner's home over there in Concord, Mary Merrick Brooks. Was there an anti-slavery society founded here in Lincoln, or did they go to some of these other towns? Because these anti-slavery societies were popping up all over New England. There were dozens of them. And so what was the involvement of parishioners here in those anti-slavery societies, if anything? Uh, in the 1840s and 50s, Unitarian ministers like Theodore Parker were, were speaking out about abolition. They, he opposed the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850. He was writing sermons, it was said, with a revolver on his desk because he was hiding fugitive slaves in his house. What were the ministers here, Reverend Ebenezer Newhall, 1835 to 1848, and William Jackson, 1848 to 1858, what were they, what were they uh, preaching about, I wonder? When the Anthony Burns trial happened in Boston in 1754 of May and there were riots and crowds and this escaped slave ended up being returned to Virginia, what were the people in this congregation in Lincoln talking about, I wonder? What role was the church taking, if any, in the public events of the day? Was there institutional action and witness, institutional silence, or maybe some combination of both? And finally, the, the, the next biggest, not the biggest, but another area that is a, still a question and an area of future discovery and exploration for me is finance. Who were the people who donated to support the church in those early years, 1740s, 50s, 60s, 70s? Was there a connection of that money to the slave trade? And as time went on in the 1800s, um, what, what kind of connection was there between money made somehow in the slave trade? And of course, we live in New England. I mean, I grew up in a church in Boston, King's Chapel, that has enormous connections to the slave trade. They have a very large endowment, and a lot of that endowment is from the um, slave trade. 
So those are the, those are the questions that I'm looking forward to exploring, hopefully with some of you in the uh, weeks and months to come. Thank you, and let's uh, listen now to our final hymn, which is Once to Every Soul and Nation by James Russell Lowell. Please join me in our call to ministry. We go forth from the worship of God to be faithful to the vision of Jesus, to affirm each person's dignity, and to cherish the living earth. God, as we go forth from our worship together, we acknowledge that we pledge to seek truth and that we are a people of great resolve but that we are not invincible. We know our own failings and flaws and vulnerabilities. Help us go from this place to be a light and a blessing to this beautiful and broken world. Help us each know what we can do to play our part. Amen. Uh, we'll now take time for... Uh announcements uh. hi I'm Katie Walker for the ministerial search committee and first of all I want to thank all of you who participated in our surveys and in our search parties we held ultimately 11 search parties with 108 people participating which we thought was great um, and those results are going to be posted soon so look for them and I want to emphasize that your engagement in this process is so important, not only because um, you know, it's informing sort of some decisions we'll make about the kinds of ministers we look at, but it's really an opportunity for all of us to understand and appreciate more about the diversity of our, our views in our congregation, to better understand who we are today, and um, to broaden our views of who we might become and therefore then to think more broadly about what kind of minister we might call. So in that spirit, we want to invite you to another phase in our work on this pro process, to a workshop on beyond categorical thinking. It's a UUA workshop that will be held on Saturday, November 13th from nine to one uh, with a break in between. A um, couple of sessions, and there's more information on that in the news briefs and in the in, on, on our website. 
So please join us for that. I think it'll be a very interesting and informative workshop. Finally, um, although we're working very closely with both our denominations uh, to um, look for ministers, we're also very open to a surprise that might come in from somewhere else. Uh, Larry Buell is leading that charge for us. So if there are ministers you've, you've heard speak or that you know of who you think might be a good fit for our congregation, please let Larry know um, or um, to send us a note via search at fplincoln.org. Thank you again. I'm Joan Kimball for the Racial Justice Journey Committee. And as Jenny said, Thursday at 7 o'clock on Zoom, Don Hafner is going to come to speak. And he's going to bring us facts and stories from the Times. He, it should be a very interesting meeting, and I hope you can join us. It's entitled Entangled Lives, Black and White, Lincoln, Black and White, Lincoln and its African American residents in the 18th century. And I do want to say that every Thursday night, except for Thanksgiving, we will have on Zoom a, a presentation, a movie, a documentary, or a talk. So please join us, and remember, Thursday nights. And uh, you can find this information in the links on the Racial Justice Journey newsletter, which I put out every Monday or Tuesday. Let me know if you want to be on it. And it's, uh, the links are also on the web and the calendar and staying connected in the parish news. And Ray's inspiring and wonderful talk last Thursday was recorded. And if you missed it, it will be found on the link will be found on the church webpage. Thank you. Good morning again. I am here to announce the engagement groups are officially going to be kicking off. Some of you might have noticed a few weeks back we did an announcement of a new program called engagement groups. These are a version of small groups not intended to replace the existing small groups that have been meeting uh, in a committed and, and enthusiastic way for so many years, but in supplementally. So these are new groups that are going to be limited to one church year and small groups that will gather together to discuss uh, spiritual reflection and journeying one's own uh, journey and to really deepen in community across various contingencies in the congregation. There'll also be racial justice engagement groups so that will be focused on what we are individually learning and growing and thinking about in our own education around racial justice. And so more information to come. Uh, come see me if you have any questions. Email me at sarah at fplincoln.org and watch the news brief this week for more details. Good morning, I'm Nancy Henderson for the Flower Committee, and I want to thank Liz Brown for the beautiful flowers in front of the church from her garden. We need more people to contribute flowers from their gardens or from the grocery store as appropriate. Um, please look for my contact information in the news briefs or on the website, and I would be happy to talk you through the process. It's very easy. Thank you. If there are no others, then um, if you choose uh, not to stay to the prelude, feel certainly free to leave now. And for the rest of us, on to the prelude. Thank you. <laughs> 